start. Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to have long-term friend and collaborator Richard Stripes with us today. Richard has been working in the field of accessibility and more importantly, uh, smart cities for a very long time indeed. Won't tell you quite how long, Richard, I'll leave that to you. Uh, 21 again, I believe, this year. Um, so welcome, Richard. I, I know you're part of the, the community in general and, and join us for Access Chat every week. It's good to have you on as a guest, finally. So can you tell us a little bit about sort of how you came to, to work in the field and, and uh, particularly about your interest in, in smart cities? Well, thank you, uh, Neil, Antonio, and Deborah, for having me. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here um, as a guest. Uh, I certainly enjoy Access Chat every week, along with the great um, and amazing community. Um, my interest in how I got started, well, it's sort of an interesting path in how I came about. Uh, I originally came from the film and entertainment industry, actually. So that's sort of a, a, a very different direction than most people come into the industry. Um, and it was through a, a number of uh, a series of development uh, when I was very young in, in doing uh, go, moving through that industry that I ended up working um, and getting hired by Walt Disney Imagineering um, based out of their Burbank offices in, Cal in Burbank, California. And it was uh, there that I really started getting the exposure to inclus uh, universal design, inclusivity, um, and accessibility as being important components and integral to the development and design of these e e great immersive environments that we were creating. Um, and, and going through that process of starting out as a young designer with the company and then working my way through the, uh, through the organization over time, I had the great privilege to work um, designing um, from concept all the way up to grand opening on four um, major theme park resorts um, uh, around the world. And, and, um, and with that, uh, I had the great privilege of, of being involved in every single aspect of that, from, um, from the conceptual design, um, sitting in a room with a handful of people, kicking ideas back and forth, trying to decide what we're going to do, well, you know, what rides and, and how things are going to be laid out and so forth, working all the way through design and engineering and construction and manufacturing. Um, and all through those processes, it's one of the things that was just really sort of key is, and that, that was always uh, a really important uh, touchstone, was inclusivity. Um, and one of the things I thought that was really interesting about that process uh, as, as I was moving through is that it wasn't a checkbox type item, which is something that later on after I left the company and started working as a consultant in the industry, uh, is, is that it, what, it wasn't just a checkbox, it was something that was integral into the overall development of what we were doing because it was important to create um, these great inclusive environments. Um, and, and that was just a key component that was just a matter of fact. If we were to include everyone, that meant including everyone, uh, any age, uh, any age group, um, ability group, um, and so forth. And so that is where uh, my interest really start, started getting peaked in, in being involved. Um, and by the time I, I left Disney, um, I did a number of different consulting things and, and, um, and met Debra um, as I was doing a development, a large development project in Costa Rica, which was going to be one of the first universally designed um, and, and accessible um, resorts and cities. And this is where the whole concept in, uh, of smart cities really started to blossom as I, as I delved into that. Um, in the design and creation of, of theme parks and resorts, these are giant, these are in essence um, smart cities. Um, they weren't called that at the time, and that's not, we just called them integrated um, developments. Uh, but the idea of many, many um, uh, data points being connected to a major system was critical to the function of the smooth functioning of, the, um, of these environments that we were creating, these large environments. So the hotels, the resorts, uh, the maintenance facilities, the, um, the engineering groups, the operations groups and, and uh, security and so forth, um, safety, all of these, uh, and food preparation and, and, and merchandising, all of these subsystems had to constantly be communicating with each other. And as a result, we were in essence creating smart, you know, smart cities way, way before they were sort of a thing. And uh, for me, what's interesting is seeing that develop from that sort of, microcosm, if you will, of the um, themed entertainment resort um, um, industry 
to something that grows and, and, and scales to a large scale uh, to a large city and, 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 and state and, and, and country international level is something that uh, I think is 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 fascinating. It's something that I'm really passionate about um, uh, pursuing and, and making sure that as we go through all of these steps, everything is is inclusive. So that was a very long winded answer to your question. Um, and, uh, and, and I apologize for that. But uh, that's really sort of how I ended up getting into this industry. And, and uh, as a result of meeting Deborah, um, pages fall off the calendar. And uh, she ultimately asks if I wanted to join her as her COO, which is where I am now. Okay, f f fantastic. Uh, and I'm really interested in the work that Disney had done because it was called out as being uh, you know, exceptional, you know, winning prizes from the NFB, etc. Um, one difference I would say that that there is between um, the theme parks, which you know are a great uh, example of a microcosm of a of a smart city environment is that they are essentially closed ecosystems in that 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 the organization owned it and could control it how do you or what challenges do you see um, with sort of scaling up into say a citywide ecosystem where it's much harder to sort of control the parameters. You don't own all of the streets. You don't own the Disney princess's castle. You know, you don't have the people in the in the fancy costumes. Okay, I'm going a bit off piece now, but but essentially, what is it, what is it that that um, where do you think the challenges lie in in delivering this at a at a larger scale? Because I mean, you did it at a, a reasonable scale already but, but but what do you think is needs to happen to to do this successfully for you know some of these massive conurbations that we now live in well that's a great question and and i think the the solution to that is something that i think many uh, many organizations city states etc governments um uh, uh, tackle with trying to solve that problem and and you know simply i would say that the most common problem is is um communication between all of these various standardization and communication as a closed environment, which we were able to have and develop, um, we were able to control and make sure that as we were designing and creating all these elements that they all naturally spoke to each other. They all spoke the same um, language, if you will. Uh, uh, you know, we all follow the same um, communication standards. That differs, of course, when you go into the real world and now you're talking about a government uh, system or, or, or city where you're dealing with multiple agencies that are dealing and controlling with different ways that they, they actually have their own internal systems functioning. And being able to, to, to communicate with all of those various subsystems. Um, and, and it really just comes down to everyone buying into an ex, a, 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 um, a, a standard of communication. How, it, you know, is that USB, is that, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's important that all of these elements um, have the ability to be able to communicate with each other. And I think that's a, that's a very serious problem. One of the things that we see right now is many of the tech companies are going through the process of sort of the VHS beta wars that we saw many years ago. Um, who's going to be the standard? Who's going to be the one that, you know, that's going to win that, right? It's, 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 um, and, and that is, I think, a problem that until that gets ultimately solved, uh, we're going to still have these issues of, of communication and ultimate and, and preventing us from ultimately achieving a true um, a smart city um, because, you know, the, the, the uh, so let, let's use the uh, transportation as, as an example. You have the, uh, the timed lights and these in the uh, street switches and so forth that that um, um, that calculate and align how traffic flows and so forth through through the course of a, of a heavy thoroughfare, heavy traffic in thoroughfare. Well, those that communication subsystem should also be be talking about um, and, and transmitting um, to the other various agencies. Uh, it can't right now because some of those systems don't talk to each other. So how can a vendor come in if every time they go into a location, they have to customize in essence, and that drives the cost up, which then, you know, prolongs how this happens and so forth. So it, it's I think one of the just fundamental problems that we face in being able to really move forward in any sort of um, it, it, with with any sort of large steps or strides is is just being able to standardize how we how these devices communicate with each with each other. 
Now, uh, Richard, I'm particularly interested now considering the complexity of managing you now all those aspects and the fact that you have people from different areas having to collaborate together to achieve some level of success that will end up in a good experience for the visitors. What was the process of, you know, of let's say, of onboarding new employees to make sure that they were able to be part of those groups and they were able to learn what was the mission? And the other is, how were you able to bring everyone together to make sure that all the bits and pieces from the project were actually working and you don't have any sort of conflict situations between, oh, you were not able to do, were not able to do your part because it's not accessible or it's not working? Yeah, certainly um, a training in checks and balances was a very, very important part of the process and it was, it was, it was just iterative, it was just constant. Um, um, and and uh, much of my time and my colleagues' time as a result of going through this process was really taken up by lots of meetings and, 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 and the sense of communication between each of us and, and the divisions and so forth. So how, how did we manage and, and do that? And I think this scales up to, I mean, I can, I can talk specifically to how and what we did in the, uh, in the Disney universe, if you will, but I think it scales up and the process is ultimately really similar um, and it scaled up to a city or, or, or state level, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so training, when a new employee came in, um, they weren't just put into, into the position and, um, and you know, there, there was, there was some on the job training, but really there was a level of training that happened that was a couple of weeks. Um, and, and depending on the position, it could be anywhere from five to 10 days of, of uh, like classroom training. Um, and that, that was something that everyone had to go through regardless of your position. That was a core uh, mission training um, and, and something that I think is one of the reasons why Disney stands out so much from everyone else, especially as, as it relates to its services and, and, and its employees, it's, it's, uh, um, it, the, the hourly employees, the people that are staff, the parks and so forth that have the public uh, interaction. Those individuals go through a tremendous amount of training so that it is very clear to them their role as an employee, as a face-to-face -face employee that deals directly with the public on how they represent the company and what they stand for, what the history of the company is, the, the legacy um, that, that Walt had laid out. Um, and so that message was, was throughout and it didn't matter. Um, and I remember in my training uh, course, when I went through it, I had VPs um, that were coming in. I had a VP from Nike um, that was uh, uh, being brought in and he was sitting right beside me. So it was you, that level of training was just constant for everyone. And I think it's really, really important for any company to, to in order for um, their employee to really understand what they're doing, it's important for them to have a, a really firm understanding of that, of that core basic mission of what the company stands for. And that way everyone is sort of pulling in the, in the same direction. All right, so training, really important. The next, the next thing is, is certainly uh, just, just communication. We had an extensive level of, of um, interdepartmental and interdivision communication. We had individuals whose sole purpose was to act as coordinators between um, uh, um, high stake um, uh, milestones, uh, schedule milestones, to make sure that all the elements that were necessary to create uh, a, a, a definitive milestone, major milestone in a schedule, that all those elements were moving together so that they all achieved and, and came together on that single milestone date. That I think is something that was, um, that was really, really effective. Um, and and it, it's complicated uh, to do, but that's, that's how we did it. And it was through that we hit, you know, it was very, very rare we, met, uh, we, we missed a, uh, a milestone. Um, and it was very rare that we had any huge major um, slips in schedule. Um, there were some times that were um, catastrophic events that happened on the site that would, you know, delay things that we had no control of, um, weather related and so forth. That that, uh, um, but but other than that, things ran relatively smooth. And again, it just came down to constant communication. So I don't Richard, know if that answered your how, question. How did that up? Because today, no, because a city needs to manage a, a similar level of complexity to bring citizens together, you know, vendors. And then even within the different uh, cities now, they have internal departments. So in your opinion, based on your, in your experience, how, how do you think they should be acting in order to be effective when they are you know, building smart cities and actually starting 
uh, in an area that is actually relevant, that they suddenly don't just decide to buy technology and call that smart cities without any particular level of engagement with the citizen and the people who actually you know could benefit from imp from improving their life quality uh, if something goes right. Well, uh, abs absolutely. You know, one of the thing is having having a plan strategy that sits, you know, short term, mid and long term. Um, you can't just go out and start at buying technology and, 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 and putting it in places and hoping that, well, you know, eventually it turns into a smart city. It really has got it. You've got to have a strategic plan laid out. Um, there are low hanging fruit. There's sort of your your two, three, you know, uh, under five year sort of milestones and goals with with accomplishing something. And that could be anywhere, you know, sized either like, you know, you pick pick something um, uh, um, like a like a park or 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 infrastructure or communication and try to decide what are the things that we need to do so that as we we integrate um, a level of of, um, of of technology that it's going to fit in with the longer plan that we have of, of sort of the mid 10 to 15 year plan and then you have your 15 to 20 25 year plan um, and how all of the elements as you sort of lay out that strategy all layer in understanding that there as you you know as, as you hit your your 10 or 12 year mark that the items that came in on year one two or three already have to have an update that that are required to to being maintained uh, to keep up to pace with all the elements it's the lack of i think understanding of that and the lack of planning to that that causes many cities to get caught into a sort of a vicious cycle of, of throwing um of what you know they get they get challenged with throwing uh, good money after bad um, and because they constantly have to sort of update. That's just the nature of the beast. All technology must be updated. It's something that we did when we when we were planning these uh, these attractions. We understood that the technology that we were installing was probably going to have to be switched out in 10 or 15 years as those technologies improved and became more efficient. So we built into them modular uh, uh, um, the, the, the ability of being modular so that they could have that without necessarily causing great um, upheaval in the attraction. Obviously, in a the theme park environment, having an attraction down for any period of time is just devastating. It dramatically affect the, the effectiveness and the profitability of, of a particular park or, or a land in the park, etc. All of those are very critical. So when it, uh, an attraction goes down, especially a major attraction, that's a, that's a serious thing if it's down for a couple hours. So to prevent that, what we did is, is carefully planned and strategized for high-risk items, the items that we felt were had high probabilities of fail over a period of time, um, and, and designed the ability for those to be swapped out easily and quickly. Um, and with that comes the ability to be able to update that technology as well and so forth. I, I think it's the lack of true understanding about the complexities of all of those um, that, that really becomes problematic for cities. A, because the people turn over very quick, B, because they have all hidden agendas about their own um, self-propulsion in, 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 their, in their own political careers and ultimately have no one really monitoring and taking care of being a steward of, of the overall strategy. These are things I think that really ultimately hurt um, um, and, 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 and cause the problems for, for, these, um, uh, for becoming smart cities. I know that we're talking about smart cities, but of course what we're really talking about here are complex projects. So we're certainly talking about it from the lens of smart cities. But I, um, one, I, I want to sort of build upon Antonio's question. Um, one thing that I see is, once again, it appears often when we're creating these smart cities or these really big complex you know, projects that um, it, it doesn't appear that the communities that are going to benefit or live in these uh, communities um, are often considered. I know that's not true. Of course, they are being considered. And I remember um, some people in the disability community, uh, really, there there's some you know leaders really standing up trying to make sure that smart cities um, are inclusive to people with disabilities and people that are aging and acquiring a disabilities and all of those things. But it feels sometimes like the conversations we're having um, from the community of people with disabilities and other conversations, smart cities, even IoT, AI, all of that, 
it seems like we're having, we're, we're like talking to the choir rather than talking to the people that are actually building the smart cities and the complex problems. And I remember, Richard, I asked you one time, if you, you know, when you were working at Disney and you wanted to make sure that the rides and the park and everything at the Disney attraction uh, was fully accessible to all of us, including people with disabilities, would you bring in, you know, contractors, you know, as a consultant, I was wondering this, um, do you bring in, you know, a, one individual or a small group of individuals? to help you understand how to make sure that you're designing for people with disabilities. And I will never forget your answer, and I, I want you to answer it for the audience here, but it just feels like often communities that are trying to make sure we're included, and I'm gonna just use the community of people with disabilities as an example, we don't really maybe sometimes go about engaging in the conversations in a way that really is how the world is working. I don't know if I'm saying that clearly. I know you know where I'm going with it, Richard, because I've pumped your brain a million times about this. But I just feel like we often are having conversations over here in, um, we're siloed conversations as opposed to really being in the thick of it saying, okay, let me tell you how you can truly include people with disabilities. Let's make sure things are accessible from all aspects, we all win. But it, it just seems like we're having siloed conversations, preaching to the choir, as opposed to really having the conversations with the people that are actually going to build these smart cities. And so I, I was just wondering, I don't know if you recall that conversation we had about how an organization like Disney would use consultants. Yeah, um, consultants was certainly a very interesting um, a component to, to Disney. Um, and and we we leveraged them a lot um, because we realized that we don't have experts on um, and everything in, internally, and so as it as it relates especially to um, dealing with accessibility um, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact conversation, but uh, but I, I, I have a. Uh, um, I, I recall on, well, on a couple. And, and I'll just tell you, yeah, I'll just say this, that what I was wondering is, does Disney just pick, you know, a disability organiz consulting organization and they just use them um, for every single aspect of the park? So the entire time that you're building the park, you have us on, um, I, I, you know, you have us on a contract and you're using one or two people. And I remember the reply was, there's almost risk to some something like this uh, gigantic, yeah, just to re yeah. help you remember. Yeah, right. And, and, and yeah, the short answer is is we um, we don't use the same people all the time. Um, and 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 the reason for that is is, is exactly um, is exactly that. Uh, um, we it's it's too big to have the opinion of of a, of a very few people. There's a, it's a very long iterative process that we go through of bringing individuals in and having them look at it so that we have as many eyes um, with the right optics looking and, and being involved and engaged in everything. Even from the, um, the early design stage, um, as we start getting into um, conceptual design and we start modeling things out and, and, um, and, and talking very specifically about uh, uh, pathways and entranceways and, and which way the building is facing and so forth, and all of the things play very, very important roles in the overall layout of, of, a, uh, of, of a themed environment like this, um, especially when you consider the amount of people that are going through it in any given year, this is, you know, it, it becomes really important um, throughput and, and how people move around. So as a result, we would bring these consultants in and have them look at the drawings, have them look at the models um, and, uh, and, get, and get their input. And we would do that at, at various stages at, at a 30%. You know, we had, we had design reviews and drawing reviews uh, every step of the way that were, um, uh, that were at the uh, 30, 60, and 90 um, percent level of completion. And those were major and uh, sort of major um, uh, touch points. But we had uh, intermediary reviews as well. And we would just bring groups in. Many times we would mock these environments up, so we would actually create scaled, uh, full-size scaled um, environments of, of a portion that we were um, had a, a, a particular concern about, and bring groups of people in, um, um, people with disabilities as well as as um, as, as everyone else, um, kids, elderly, and and so forth, um, and and bring them and have them through, and then just ask them questions. And and many times we didn't ask them questions because what they did was far more important than what they say. 
Um, and be, because human nature being human nature, it was far more critical to sort of capture on video how they interacted with the environment, what they did, and what was the propensity of how they moved and acted and, and, and engaged with the environment. These are things that we did um, iteratively over and over and over and over again um, with many, many different aspects of, of the attraction. And so consultants played a huge, huge role in being able to deliver that message um, in, a, in a way that was genuine. Because um, that's the thing that was more important than anything for us is to have that genuine, um, uh, the, the genuine opinion. Um, you know, go, going back to what you also um, said about how that scales up to a large city or to to a large complex environment, um, it it engaging with consultants and getting the opinion of, of of just sort of the everyday people. I think many times what happens, especially in a large governmental <coughs> environment or, or situation is that they they go out and they and they get the large name organizations and and so forth and and as a result i think there's a problem with that there's an inherent problem that they're going to tell them you know those organizations tend to tell them what they want to hear so they get hired again next time and and, and so forth and i think that there is a little bit of um well i don't think they can be as genuine as they could be if they were asking just the real people asking real people that, that have no uh, connection or no, um, or, or no specific, um, um, any, uh, don't have anything to gain by giving either a good or bad response to, to that. It's that level of genuine response, I think, that is really, really critical. And I think oftentimes gets missed, especially when you're dealing with large government contracts and so forth. And you know what, that's a really good point. And I just want to comment. That's why, because the reality is a complex, project like this worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The reality is you're probably not going to bring in, you know, one or two people off the street. You'll work somebody, I'll, I'll just give Atos a shout out because I know Atos is very involved in smart cities and things like that. But the good news about using um, a vendor like Atos, who is, you know, I understand it's gigantic, but is that they have groups like Neil's that employ people people with disabilities and are committed to accessibility and are part of it. So uh, it almost seems like if I were in their shoes, I would almost feel more comfortable using a bigger corporation like an ATOS on these projects if they're really representing our community and other communities. It almost seems like there's a reduction of risk rather than using you know, a tiny, uh, other tiny companies, not, not to, um, I think everybody should use Root Global Communications, but I'm just trying to be practical mm -hmm. here because just the sheer size of these projects and Neil, I don't know if you want to make a comment. Yeah, here, but I, I will. It just, yeah, it seems like there's some risk reduction if you can get the right vendors that are big enough to stand behind what they're doing, but also make sure our community is being heard. So, so for sure, large organisations like to transfer risk. Um, it's 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 what the you know pays for the lawyers' houses um, <laughs> when they're writing these contracts. That said, um, even as a large organisation ourselves, we would then go out and work with smaller organisations. So, so essentially, what you're doing is you're shifting the the, the consultation and the 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 community involvement just down the line. You're you're, you're subcontracting that, if you like, to to another organisation. Now, um, I think it's still really important that we don't just get employees doing it, but as Richard said, uh, that that you work with a range of experts and then the the general public and, uh, as my mother would say, the great unwashed. Um, because we, you, you want that really gritty feedback, and 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 I think I, I sort of stand with Richard. You know, and whilst you know, as large corporations and as people engaged in the industry, we definitely want the work. We also um, want stuff to be successful, and we want stuff to work for people and for that feedback to be unfiltered. Now, we, we may present that feedback in, in, a, in, in one particular way, and we've got, we've got uh, you know, a way of doing that, and we'll talk in terms of standards and everything else, which is really useful for, for large organizations, but equally, they need 
the, the basic unfiltered feedback and the, the stuff that, that Richard was talking about, the videos of people not telling them what they think they want to hear. Because that's, that's there's, you know, there's, there's real meat in that uh, in terms of getting genuine useful insights into how uh, organizations uh, could, could design better products. Do you want to come back on that, Richard? Yeah, uh, you know, ab absolutely. I, I think um, that unfiltered uh, that unfiltered information was really critical. And and to that end, um, even after the park opens, um, we still continue that process. We have individuals that stand outside the gates between that large space between the gates and the trams, or the or the trams and the parking lot. So this is after they're already out of the environment and they're sort of winding down and they're heading back toward their, their, their real world. Um, we ask them, we ask them one question. There's individuals, usually uh, anywhere from a dozen to 20 individuals that, that are sort of scattered around outside that large area as people are exiting um, at the end of the day. And as, as, a, as a family or an individual is approaching them, um, they ask them one question so that they don't have to stop. They can answer as they keep moving the idea is not to um, is to get a raw answer feedback without having to have them stop and think about it because that's the value in, in, in the question and that feedback is actually poured over the data that's collected from that the the exit the exit questions the exit interviews are are poured over and real um, real hard decisions are made based purely off that intelligence that's gathered from those individuals. Because because of its raw nature, because of its unfiltered nature, um, that feedback uh, um, is really really critical. And every we do it at every single one of the parks and resorts um, every single day. So that's so, so that's really interesting. And again, you've got the commercial angle. If I may sort of spin that back to my original question, how do we translate that? Um, to a, a large scale for a city, you know, how do you know? How do we collect exit data on your public transit system? I mean, you could just have people standing outside stations going, you know, how was your journey today? And and um, you know, but but but, but, but oh, yeah. Did, you know, that would you know, be interesting. You know, <laughs> well, I mean, we do have people, and they they do get some proper, you know feisty feedback from time to time not out not our people but essentially you know you go on the, the the underground and they'll have people standing there and uh they get a, a real earful sometimes but but essentially how do you how do you sort of knit that together because the the thing about the smartness of smart cities is as you say it's the interconnectedness it's the the passing through of data um the the feeding of the useful information to improve people's experiences and with our lens on things improving people's experiences so that everybody can access the the cities and the facilities and everything else because that's where we see the great potential of all of this data sharing and the technology is that we can enable people with disabilities to to participate to the fullest yeah you know i think i think um scaling that scaling that is very is is challenging there's no question and i think one thing that needs to change is is with the way that sort of response happens now um like you know social media for example people um will um will act and talk on social media about um about their experience the problem with that is that it, it's it's very polarized the people that ultimately come on and, com and complain or fill up surveys online and so forth are individuals that for the most part have gone through either a very negative experience or an extremely positive experience that either either direction they feel compelled they have to say something the problem is those are very those are on the extreme ends um what the data that's missing is all that stuff in between and and that's why the you know the reason why um at disney those exit interviews are so critical is because the people don't have a choice they can choose not to answer and walk by but in truth, most people do because it's one question as they're, as they're being asked as they're walking up. So as a result, we get a large portion of that sort of middle area. Um, and as a result, that data is extremely valuable. So how does that translate into, into the real world of a, of a city? Well, <laughs> very difficult, I, I would have to say, given the way our systems exist today. I, I think we need to create a, um, 
a, 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 a public um, a public relations gr uh, um, a group or, or, or committee in each one of the environments where something like this is being seriously considered to be able to get that. Now, I mean, they have town halls and, and so forth, but those are all very, very singular activities that, again, for the most part, only the loud mouthpieces go to those events. And again, those individuals end up being very extreme in one way or the other. If, if they're constant, if there's a way that there's a constant feedback, um, a way of, of being able to talk to the regular person that has just sort of a regular opinion about things, I think we can get, um, we, we will be armed with much more valuable data and as such armed with that data will dictate and, and help, uh, help leaders um, decide which directions to go, where things, what things to focus on, what things, and, and start prioritizing. And as you prioritize now, you start being able to lay out a large uh, 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 schedule. Yeah, uh, that, that's it. It's, 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 it's very tricky to knit all of this together, but I think that if, uh, if we can find a way to collect that data from those that are somewhat more reticent, um, that, that would be really useful. Uh, we're at the end of our time. It's been fascinating chatting with you. I need to obviously thank uh, uh, our constant friends, Barclays and MyClearText, for all of their support. Um, and um, we look forward to you joining us and leading a, uh, a fascinating conversation on Twitter. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you all very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.